Chris, welcome to the Basketball Performance Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on, William. Excited to talk to you. Yeah, well, definitely a lot of good topics today to talk to you about. But before we dive into them, can you just give us a little bit, bit of background on where you're from, how you got into hoops, and how you eventually got into coaching? Short story uh, or long story, I guess, is the question. But uh, I'll keep it short. But uh, from a very young age, I was aligned with, uh, you know, definitely sport and kind of the mental side of the game and very intrigued by that. Wasn't the best athlete, so always dove into kind of how – how could I be better, you know, and eventually, obviously, I learned that was related to decision making and a lot of these other areas that you can gain a perceptual advantage over a physical advantage. So that led me down the path of uh, potentially being a teacher. Uh, but uh, pretty soon into my college years, I learned that I really loved coaching. I coached at a local YMCA grade, uh, seventh and eighth grade girls and boys, and I just loved it. And from there, I just went all in and uh, everything from there I devoted towards you know, education and educating myself informally and formally to the best I could to become the best coach I could. And uh, fortunately at 28, after many, many experiences, I got a head coaching job at a college and I was an 18 year college coach and had great experiences at two different colleges. And, uh, you know, obviously all that led me to the path that we're talking today, which is basketball immersion and everything that goes with that. But uh, yeah, I was always excited by the technical tactical battle of coaching, but also by the aspect of, uh, being able to see people grow. I just think it's a really unique opportunity for us in sport and coaching in general to be able to be around people. Uh, when you see them be vulnerable and see them be in a situation where they want to improve and they desire improvement and uh, you know you get a real chance to be able to see them grow if you do a good job as people and as, as athletes. Right, definitely. And so you mentioned your website, which is just an amazing website, Basketball Immersion. How did, were you first introduced to those kind of methods and theories and all that kind of evidence-based work. And why did you want to, I don't wanna use the word challenge, but why did you think that there was a different way to approach the game rather than the traditional way? Yeah, you know, to that second part, I guess I was surprised. Like I didn't really know that a lot of what I had learned in my undergrad in, uh, you know, a kinesiology degree, human kinetics degree, phys ed degree, whatever you wanna call it, but a lot of that stuff I learned in motor learning and skill acquisition, it really resonated with me and it seemed to make sense. And it seemed like, again, like even through my teaching degree, when I did a teaching an education degree, uh, I was just surprised at how few of these methods were actually applied in a practical way, whether it's in a sport coaching environment or in a teaching environment in a classroom. So to me, that led me down that rabbit hole of kind of trying, trying to figure out why and uh you know, and a lot of it just comes back to cultural norms that we just do what we we're used to doing and we do what we're taught and nobody really thinks otherwise to be able to challenge the norms and uh, that's really what led me to ultimately share basketball immersion but uh, the, the, the genesis of all that was information from skill acquisition and motor learning classes in my undergraduate degree and my master's degree uh, when I did the National Coaching Institute in Canada and was exposed to some really high level thinkers that were just challenging us to go hey, this is all proven. Why are we not using it in coaching? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and obviously being around a ton of practices and a ton of coaches over the years, I just found that it wasn't as widely shared or used as it could have been. And that led to basketball immersion. Mm. So since you do so much work within North America and around the world, how um, prevalent do you think it is that how many out of 10 coaches how many coaches would you say use it internationally or in North America from your experience well it's a really hard put a number to but uh, yeah, it's yeah. It, it's low I mean but it's higher okay <laughs> as a positive like it's higher than it used to be and I think that's again just a testament to say basketball Twitter or so many different places where we as coaches can can seek knowledge and learn from others and challenge some of our traditional thinking. And uh, I do believe there's a much more open-mindedness amongst coaches in general, but basketball coaches specifically about challenging the ways that they traditionally do them. And I think the analytics movement, which has done things in a really different way has done that for coaches. And I think it's helped pave the groundwork for looking at how we teach, you know, because analytics became this thing that became widely accepted very quickly and it challenged a lot of traditional norms. And because there was like, you know, this quantitative information behind it, I think it, it did resonate 
quite quickly with people. Whereas I think somewhat when we deal with teaching and how we teach, I think it tends to be a little bit more abstract with people. So mm -hmm. it takes a little longer, but I think the foundation is there for people and the open-mindedness is there for people. And it's just a question of how much they want to dig into it, you know, to be able to, again, challenge and stimulate how they coach. Okay. So this is a question that I, because I completely buy into what you're saying. This is something that I wonder all the time. As a basketball coach, how much of the research and the textbooks and the, the evidence-based, scientific-based stuff should I read into? Because, you know, at, at the end of the day, I don't want to become a uh, motor learning scientist. I want to be a basketball coach. I want to apply what they know to the game. How much of this should I read? How deep into it should I go? Just enough that you have an ability to be able to explain the why to your players, to your right. parents, to your administrators. But beyond that, yeah, you don't need the incredible depth. And I think, again, intuitively, if you think about something like random versus block practice, intuitively, it's not hard to understand, you know, because let's say, for example, again, William goes to the free throw line and he shoots 10 shots in a row from the same spot versus he alternates where he shoots from just in terms of distance forwards a little bit backwards you know and just alternates that he knows that there's a difference in those things and i think that intuitively is easy for people to understand but then to just be able to explain why it leads to better retention and better ultimately retrieval practice that leads to retention i think just that basic understanding of being able to explain that on each repetition of random practice we are challenged to think so it becomes mindful, whereas when we do blocked, it's mindless. And really that distinction between being mindful and mindless, I think is the basic part that most people just need to understand. And then that helps under explain the why. Right. So you use the example of the free throw, which is an interesting one because it's rather a closed skill. It's more of a closed skill than open. Like there's no decision making there. Right. So right. in terms of having a variation for something like that, can you give us different examples of variations? And but Chris, I'm shooting from the same spot every time. Why would I need to be shooting in front of the free throw line to the side of the free throw line? Maybe staggered stance. Why would I have to do that? That might not make sense to some people. Yeah, and I understand why it doesn't make sense because it's not, again, traditionally how we develop shooting. We develop right. shooting that you shoot from the same spot over and over again and you get good at that spot and yeah, it builds your comfort and confidence. But the point is, does it transfer to competition? And we know to a certain extent it doesn't fully transfer because that's not how that skill is used in a game. A skill in a game like shooting is used in a lot of different variable situations. And in fact, you would argue in a sport like basketball, there's never, ever the same shot over and over again in the exact same way in the same context. And that includes a free throw where each time you shoot a free throw, the, you know, the time and score or the situational aspect of the game changes. Right. So right. to practice in more of those conditions and under which you play helps lead to us transferring the skill or the decision more to the game. And that's the general mindset of practicing. Now there is a balance to that. And the balance to that is obviously trying to balance comfort and confidence and building say a player's confidence and understanding of that they have the skill, you know, versus challenging them to be able to use it in random and variable ways. And we know that then when they can replicate something we teach them in a game situation, then that is learned. Because ultimately the only test for us as a coach or for a player to know if they are learning is that they can apply something in a game situation mm -hmm. because we can create all these really, you know, useful and wonderful drills or small sided games in a practice where we know the skill is going to evolve and it's going to happen. But the true test is, can they use it in a game in a novel situation? And that's what basketball presents us constantly is these novel situations. Yeah, that's, Really good. That makes a lot of sense. So say, for example, now I've, I've learned about basketball immersion. I've learned about block versus randomized training. I'm in. What is, it can be a little bit scary in the beginning. I might be a little bit nervous because I don't know how to administer this kind of practice. What are some easy ways coaches can gradually move into this um, that you've seen since you've been using this so long? Well, two, two really easy ways. Let's give you a shooting example first. And that's this BDT shooting concept, whether it's shoulder game or BDT shooting, you can search our basketball immersion YouTube channel and see examples of that. No problem. But it basically before a player shoots, preceding a player shooting, we make sure that they go through a perception and a decision prior to skill execution. Mm -hmm. And that's the part of any skill that we execute as a player in a practice or in a game situation follows this concept of we perceive, 
then we decide based on what we perceive, and then we execute based on what we decided. And then the fourth part is we get feedback. Right. So when we add BDT, which is for a simple example, for those that are listening, if I pass William the ball, you know, and he's standing somewhere on the floor, if my hands are out, my arms are out, he passes back to me. And if my arms are down, then he shoots. So prior to every shot, he has to be mindful and go through this perception and decision process before he actually executes the skill. Real simple way to be able to get a player to, again, think before they execute something. So it's mindful. In a team situation, the easiest way to transfer what we're talking about is just create a game condition or a game situation, whether it's offense or defense that you want to work on and work on it offense versus defense. And that is as simple as it gets. If we want to work on, you know, cutting from the top, then we can set up an easy three on three small sided game where it must start with a cut, a passing cut. And then from there we can work on, you know, different constraints or different types of things to be able to shape exactly what we want in terms of the skill or the decision. But it's really just replicating the game situation in a small sided game or a game, you know, offense versus defense situation. Right, really cool. And to add on to that, something that I took from you, which was incredibly powerful but simple, is the concept of must versus a possibility, right? And in basketball, everything is a possibility. But a lot of times we set up our skill development where everything is a must, say, whether it's five spot shooting, catch and shoot, catch and shoot. Um, like you mentioned, there's not much thinking going on there. My brain can kind of go over, over to overpilot. And within the game setting, the shot might not be the best decision at that time. So again, just to go off what you said, like that really resonated with me where you make more options available and possibilities available rather than just brainlessly going over a skill to, um, over and over again. But when I'm thinking about it, you mentioned comfort and confidence, Chris, is there a time for block practice? Well, into that example of must and possibility, there absolutely is a time for block practice. And that is what, you know, we would call in our community, we call them reconnections. And the only difference for us would be that uh, we probably wouldn't start with a must. We would start with possibilities and then teach them musts that they can go back and introduce into the situation. And if you want to think about it this way, like we would start and teach them, say, three on three something, you know, we said this pass and cut example, we'll teach it in the game context first. And then if we need to, we'll go and break down the actual skill, say the pass or the cut, you know, we could do that on air or we could do that in a more manageable, maybe a two on one type of situation. So before, you know, something becomes a must, we want to see if they first need to learn it in that type of blocked manner. Mm -hmm. Right. And often we put players in situations where they do unnecessary progressions because we predetermine what they need to learn and when they need to learn it. And all I'm really suggesting to people is start with more of the game and then decide what they actually need to be blocked taught or to be taught, as we said, with maybe just two possibilities. And that's the thing. It's not about all options. It can be just like eating at a buffet where, you know, Chris at the buffet can only have the salad bar right now, but William can have salad bar, pasta bar, and meat mm -hmm. because he is more skilled. Right. And as we know, skill mm -hmm. equals confidence. Skill equals confidence. Like any player in the world, you know, any parent in the world, they ask me, how do they help their son or daughter get more confident? It's like, they got to get more skilled. And that's another part of this is we're not doing this in the absence of, you know, skill being important. Mm -hmm. We're doing this understanding that skill is incredibly important but it's even more important when it's combined with the context of the decision, because that's how it's applied in a game. 100%. And I'm just thinking, I'm just, my mind is jogging, just thinking about past experience of kids who work on stationary ball handling all day long. And then you put them into a game setting and they lose the ball because then they have to put, they have to bring their head up and make a decision. And it's a completely different skill on its own. But going off what you said, was very interesting about starting with, I don't want to call it the whole, but starting with the possibility one of the things that you introduced me uh, was the concept of slow learning five on five. And to be honest, we don't, at, at Strive where I, I work, we don't do any five on O. Can you explain the concept of slow learning five on five? Um, how is it different? Why would you start five on five? Why wouldn't you start five on O and slowly progress to five on five? Yeah, so it's, it's, it all relates back to what we've talked about already is that we want to give the learners context. 
And the context in which they need to use the skills or decisions in a game is based on whether there's, a, you know, the position of an offense or defensive player. Okay. So we need to have the offense and defense on the floor for so the players immediately perceive why they're doing something they're doing. So say we're setting up a play and it's five out pass and cut. Well, why are they cutting? They're cutting because there's pressure. Well, what happens if there's no pressure? What happens if a defender is off them? Those are two different decisions. You know, if you replace a player who cut because that space has been created and now you're filling that space, there's really two decisions. Is there pressure or is there not pressure? And mm -hmm. if there's pressure of a defender there, then cut back door. And if there's no defender there, then catch it. And then you're into a shot or drive decision. Well, right. it's much easier to teach that in the context of having the defender there and to be able to show them in a really slow way. And we're talking about, say, 60 percent VO2 max, meaning people can walk or jog and talk at the same time. This is not meant to be full speed, but they're getting perceptual reps at the same time. They're getting these decision and skill reps. And it just helps connect it for a player. And then, as you said, we can always go back and do the on air. We can always go back and do the five and zero reps if we need them. Right. That's great. Um, a couple of the terms that I learned from the website was the concept of fighting for your feet and then the stab dribble. Can we talk about that one at a time? Because I think that's very powerful concepts as well. Well, thank you. And that's just like through years of reps at camps and teaching, especially younger kids and trying to come up with language that they understand. So fight for your feet is everything in shooting, everything in basketball starts from the feet. But we want to represent it for a player, not just in the sense that, yeah, get your feet to the ground. We want them to fight to get to their feet to the ground as fast as possible, which applies Newton's third law, which is action reaction. And generally, all that players need to be able to produce power, whether it's to shoot, drive or pass, is this action reaction. So I drive my feet to the ground, I get power back from the ground. And now, if I don't pause, I get to continue with that energy into the decision. Mm. And that's really the mindset of that is that uh, when I fight for my feet, I'm really actively engaged in trying to get my feet to the ground to get the balance to get to, you know, this, this optimal low position, whatever you define that is, we would call it a, um, you know, just, just, a, you know, we call it wet toilet seat position, but it's like, you're, you're, you're in a short squat, not a deep squat you know, mm -hmm. that type of situation and just your legs are loaded. So that's a part of that. And that's fight for your feet. The stab dribble is really, again, this is from Europe and places in the world that have played FIBA rules for years, but it's just related to, you know, in America, we tend to be able to catch the ball and jab and go or catch the ball and cross over and go or catch the ball and just go. And uh, obviously the rules are a little bit different in the FIBA game. And most players have adapted to that by just getting the ball to the ground. So proceeding anything else with footwork is get the ball to the ground. So immediately when I catch it, I stab the ball or I throw it down. And some parts of the world, they call it a throw down dribble where immediately I catch it and I throw the ball to the ground. And that's when I've decided I'm going to drive. I'm not shooting and I get the ball down so I can get faster. In my opinion, you can get faster to the decisions rather than the footwork. And it basically eliminates the travels that we might think from players, you know, you know, stepping before they dribble. Uh, because we're getting the ball to the ground and and there's videos on our YouTube page free for both of those that people can go check out too for stab dribble and uh, fight for your feet. Yeah, awesome. That's something that I learned and and initially I kind of disagreed with that in the beginning. I was like, why would why would I like eliminate all my options by putting the ball immediately down the floor? But it makes a lot of sense. And yet, like you're right after watching like some Euro League and like other levels of Europe, it's something that it's just built into their system. Everybody's just able to do it, and therefore you don't get many travel calls. Um, over. And you're seeing it in North America all over the place now. And again, I think it's something that uh, players do naturally. And that's mm -hmm. where I learned this. I learned this from players, not from coaches. And then I thought that I was teaching something counterintuitive to what a player actually wanted to do, which is just when they've decided to drive, they just want to get the ball down. Yeah. Right. Instead of going through this perfect long step or these jabs or crossovers or stuff like that. Um, and you're seeing it. I mean, you're seeing now with players with a lot more freedom, they just do it naturally. Right. Right. Okay. So we're going to dive into the skill acquisition part a little bit more. Um, can you talk to us about what platform drills are? And then after you describe what a uh, platform drill is, can you talk about how we can layer the platform drill in order to teach different basketball concepts? Yeah. Platform drills are just to be able to simplify 
things for a player and for a coach. Because if we think about it, like we know physically, like you or I have a limit on the physical capacity we can put forward in a day. Like at some point we're going to be tired if we're just working all day. The same thing applies to our, our brains, to our cognitive side of things, to the mental side of things. So for me, a platform drill just makes it easier to be able to get players or me as a coach to be able to use the same drill over and over again. So I'm not reteaching drills. It's like, okay, let's say we're in three and three closeouts, three and three closeouts. Well, all my players already know that drill. And now once they know this platform drill, now through constraints or different manipulations, uh, changing the score, for example, scoring system, I can manipulate the drill to shape what I want to have happen. And that just makes it simpler for a player and simpler for a coach, because instead of having a lot of drills, I have one drill or two drills or four drills that I can constantly manipulate that my players don't put a lot of cognitive effort into learning. So we can focus on the things that actually we want to develop, which is the skills and decisions that apply to the game. Right. And then you can layer in different ways. Like you mentioned that you can change the scoring system. You can, uh, you can, and you can work on offense and defense at the same time. So simultaneously, that's more basketball. Two, like Two way well. teaching. Yeah. Two way teaching. And then as you said, layering uh, desirable difficulties or challenge. I mean, that is the challenge for a coach is like, you know, we want to make our players like, and it seems like a contradiction, but we want to make our players comfortable when it comes to the game. But when we're thinking about development, we want to make them uncomfortable at an optimal level so right. that they can reach and strive beyond their level. So right. once a player knows a very, you know, this basic platform drill, now I have to layer it with challenge or difficulties to get, be able to, ha again, keep them reaching beyond their current level. And we do know this, that we learn through struggle. Like we don't learn through perfection. We learn through struggle. So if I want a player to improve, they have to struggle and then reach beyond their level. Yeah, that's, that's, and I work with younger kids and I know that you do, uh, you do as well. And a lot of the times, just the simple setup of the drill. So the platform drill itself, you're setting it up really takes a toll on their working memory. And then they may not remember anything after that. So having something that you can come back to time and time again is something that well, saves you a lot of time. But it also, you, you can see that the players are actually able to do what you want to do and use the concepts that you want them to learn, which is the most important thing. It's not learning the platform drill, yeah. it's to actually yeah, the, do those concepts. I'm glad you brought that up because again, it relates to active learning time on time on task, right? Yep. Which is our players learn by doing. So the more time that we spend as coaches talking and organizing them, right. the less time they spend learning. Absolutely. So, these quick drills that they know already, they get into them. And then all we have to do is manipulate the constraint, or as you said, the scoring system to be able to layer and challenge. Right. And then we talked about the working memory, Chris, and this is one of the weaknesses I feel like I have. And I'm sure other coaches do as well, is that you want to transfer what you know to them. And it might be as soon as possible, which is not a good thing. And you might give too much information. So how can how can we, in your experience, build, give them a solid understanding of the concepts that we want to use? And then how long before the next concept, um, before I put the next concept on? And so that's not going to be like a, a straight answer. Everybody's different. But from your experience, especially when dealing with youth, do you have any kind of idea on what you've seen and, and experienced in terms of that? Well, of course, it's nonlinear, as you just yeah. said, like it's it's so individual and so different. But, uh, you know, as a general rule, like, I mean, you, you can kind of say that, uh, you know, if one or two players are struggling with something, then, you know what, we got to go on, like, right. we got to move on, right? And it's like those one or two players, we need to find a way to connect the information for them differently. And, uh, you know, it could be three or four, like, I'm not saying it's got to be one or two, but generally, when most of the team or more than 50% of the team has a basic understanding of the concept, this doesn't mean perfection but they have a basic understanding of the concept and they can kind of apply it, you know, in some context, then we can layer and move on, but right. we're going to always lose learners. Like that's the thing. And that is by nature, just coaching and teaching and all these different things. So the question is how much effort are you going to put into some of those individuals that are struggling? Uh, and, th and that involves a lot more individual reps and a lot more aftercare 
than say some of the platform or some of the different drills that we use up front. Right. You know, they don't pick it up quicker. So they need a new context or a different way, but I don't want to hold back all of the learners that have already learned things. And that's the challenge. I mean, yeah. generally as a rule too, William, to go with that, I tend to coach to the highest level and not to the lowest level. And if mm. you coach to the highest level, you can raise the middle, right? And if you coach to the middle, Mm, you're probably losing the highest level and right. you're probably not raising the lower as much as you can the middle. And I think that's always the goal to get that middle to the higher level um, and always coach to your highest. And that's very interesting. That's something that I haven't really put much thought to. That's, but it makes a whole lot of sense. It makes a whole lot of sense. So Chris, you used to, you were at the college level before. In general, what's one thing that you feel high school players are lacking when they make that transition into college? Well, of course, uh, I mean, the, the obvious one is the physicality that just changes from one yeah. level to the next, right? How much more physical the game gets. But, uh, you know, if we're thinking more about tactics or, you know, technique or something like that, I definitely think it's like the complexity of defense. Mm. And that obviously drives offensive learning because everything's two-way learning. And I yeah. think that's an advantage of playing a lot of offense versus defense as well is that you're getting a lot of two-way repetitions and not just focusing on one. But if we think about the college level, now instead of having this one way that you defended ball screen in high school, you probably we have three or four different possibilities right. for defending ball screen, depending on scout and personnel and all these different things. So really it's the complexity of the defense that I think goes up in level. And then with that, obviously it challenges the offense right. in a really different way, because all of a sudden maybe you were used to the team only switching ball screens for a whole game. And now all of a sudden within the game, they're changing the, you know, it's a random ball screen defense and you have to figure it out and find solutions. So that aspect of it, I think drives, the next level and it's a real fun time it's a real exciting level and uh, generally again high school players are pretty excited to be able to get to that point yeah do you feel like a lot of high school players um are familiar with the decision making training and all that kind of stuff or the, like the majority of the players that come in are completely fresh yeah it totally depends i would say as a rule like during my time there i'd say almost all the players that came in were used to more traditional drill based yeah. practices and when they got to our practice and we're playing five on five almost the whole practice you know they, they definitely like it and they want to do it but yeah. some of them yeah. really struggle with understanding why they're struggling and yeah. then we have to put it in perspective for them that's saying hey listen it's the same situation with that shooting example like if i just have you shoot shots dead on from the three-point line you know and you shoot 25 shots you're probably going to shoot 70 percent plus you know, but the reality is in a game, if we have you shoot from variable spots, you're rarely ever going to shoot 70% and more likely your shooting percentage is somewhere around the forties. So we just have to give that perspective to players that you will struggle more practicing this way, but ultimately it replicates the game and will transfer more information to the game is the hope. Right. And we touched upon defensive complexities. And one of the things that I learned from you, Chris, and from the, the site is the concept of the three, two matchup zone. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and how does it differ from other zones that we may see? Well, I mean, and again, you made this point kind of uh, when we, when we talked about some of the things you're going to ask and it's like, yeah, look, player to player defense, man to man defense is priority. Number one for any right. youth players, like learning how to compete and cover the ball one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, that's the most important thing. I wouldn't worry about a lot of complexity beyond that. If we can develop young players to be able to cover the ball one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's man or zone, whatever it is, then they're going to have success as they move mm -hmm. up in levels. Uh, and that starts from a closeout or the stance on the ball or being able to cut off and defend one or two dribbles. So that applies to zone or man. But the 32 defense is really, to me, is essentially, if you want to think about it, it's a switching zone. So it's kind of a bastardized man to man and zone. And it really allows us to be a lot more flexible within a zone where we can go with cutters and we can kind of distort what an offense perceives. Uh, and use it as more of a true matchup and uh, you know wherever the ball comes up the floor we want the middle of the three two to be able to start and cover the ball and then essentially from there the first pass a wings got it and the second pass one of the lower players in the three two one of the base of the three two would have the next pass and uh, you know we want to bump and we want to stay within the three two as much as possible and uh, you know just a lot of fun and for us it gave us a lot of variability in terms of people not being able to figure out sometimes what we were in, even though we we're a base man to man team, it just allowed us to be able to mess with people. Uh, and that's part of coaching, right. To try and get them a little bit confused or distorted with what they're seeing. So within the game, how, 
how many possessions or how what was the percentage that you'd actually use the 32 matchup zone? So it depended on the team. It depended right. on the year. We used it every year, but some teams we used it a lot more. And some teams, and I would say generally how we used it too, is that um, as soon as there was a ball reversal or as soon as there was a ball screen within when we we're in 32, we would switch into man. So it was just really honestly a starting point. So us to be able to be consistent in our matchups and to be able to take teams out of their initial offensive flow, especially their man-to-man sets. And then once the ball moves, then we essentially go into man-to-man. Okay. So, you know, it would be switching within the possession of basically from zone to man is how we traditionally used it mm. more and more as our, as our season went on and players got a lot more comfortable with it. Yeah. And definitely the next one, which I also learned from you, and I highly recommend people check this one out, is the two-side transition. Talk to us a little bit about that. What is the goals for the two-side transition? Are, are we seeing it more and more in the modern game? And again, what are the concepts? What are the goals of the two-side transition? Well, whether you're seeing the two-side or not, you're seeing almost all teams now run to corners. Whereas in the past, if you think about traditional fast breaks, we ran into these secondary breaks. So our primary break was really pointless because we were just trying to get into these secondary actions. And if we'd have players stop at the 45s and not fill the corners. But in the modern game, obviously, we're trying to create as much space as possible. So we have players run to the corners to fill the corners, and then we'd still fill the 45. So if we want to think about, uh, you know, a spacing template, whether it's five out or four out, we'd have a two, we'd have the corners filled, and then we'd have the 45 or both 45s filled. And that essentially forms a two side, a player in the corner and a player on the 45. And why would we do that? We would do that in particular to be able to create more space on the floor. So if we do hit ahead, we have driving gaps and we have driving lanes. And if we don't hit ahead, then point guard can push into space and into gaps. And also because we're trying to create gravity, which is a cool modern word for we're trying to create spacing. So the defense has to cover more of the floor. So if I'm standing in the corner and I'm a shooter, then a help defender has to know that I'm there and they have to account for me. And they have to make a decision. And we want to put defense constantly in these decisions about, okay, do they have to send two to the ball? And all good offensive advantage is draw two to the ball. Hmm. You know, and if I don't draw two to the ball, then I should be able to score in one-on-one situations right. or keep my check score in one-on-o situations. <laughs> but if I don't, then the other positive outcome of the situation, whether it's an advantage, is to draw two. And if we draw two, we want to move the ball as fast as possible. So the idea of the fast break, especially the two side, is that we're attacking the weak side of the floor because usually transition defense recovers down the middle. So we're trying to create this kind of advantage on the weak side of the floor and, you know, lead to these potential two-on-ones. Right. Or or like a long closeout where we have an advantage and we can drive to the, to the rim. Yeah. And create dominoes and all those cool words that, you know, right. and I think, again, like, you know, people can kind of say sometimes like, oh, you know, you're just making up a new word for the same thing. And it's like, OK, or we're just coming up with a better word to describe it. Right. Right. And I think that's really what the two side is. I mean, cer- certainly people have used this concept and they still continue to use the concept. But I think the two side just helps because it stays consistent with ball screen, which is so dominant in the game today. It's like, are you running a ball screen off a single side or off a two side? Are right. you defending a ball screen off a single side or a two side? And right. both of those change decisions for the offense and for the defense. Right. Definitely. And when you're running the two side, I'm guessing since we're, we're primarily looking over towards the weak side to fill uh, the 45 and the corner, does that mean, I'm just trying to give people a better picture. Does that mean that the outlet players seeking the sideline or where, where do you ideally want them to go? Or does it not matter that much? So we want, we want to sprint corners, and that's number one. We want to fill corners. And those players really, if they aren't getting the ball at half court, their just job is to sprint the corners and, and stand still and hold their spacing and be ready because we know that against good teams, that last pass in a rotation is usually into a corner spot to be able to create an advantage. So we want to hold corners. The second player on a side, so the second player on a two side, we actually want them to delay. We don't want them to run full speed. We want Mm. them to delay so that they can potentially catch it in more space. So we do want to hit ahead if we can, if that's available. I find that most good teams take away ball side hit aheads, right? Like most defenses are loaded in transition to take away the rim, the ball and ball side hit aheads. So what we're trying to do is trying to go cross court with the dribble or with the pass and attack the weak side. So if you think about that two side player, 
being kind of almost like a trail on the weak side wing. We want to get that player the ball because they can drive that 45 or they can play in space or make that extra pass to the corner. And generally that's where the defense does not account for a player in transition, or it's the last player they account for in transition. And that's the mindset of trying to attack to the weak side on the two side. One thing that I love about the two side is that how, how would you, if you were coaching against the two side, Chris, how would you try and disrupt it? Because what I've seen is that people know you're trying to spread the floor. So then they, they go ahead and spread the floor, right? Which leads to a great action that could be a dribble handoff, a gets, or a one-on-one. How would you go about trying to disrupt the two side? Yeah, I mean, exactly what you just said is, is, is what I've seen through years of using it is that like early in the year, teams have a very traditional way of covering, which is that's loading down the middle or down the tunnel in transition. But as they start to play us, say, the second time or they're starting to get in the scout deep into our conference schedule, you find that teams really spread out to take away our weak side advantage or our two side advantage. And that opens up the point guard push to be able to attack off the dribble. Like essentially, again, if everyone's denied, then I'm one on one and my job is to score or to draw help. So that's a huge part of it. So if I'm thinking about that as a as a defensive problem, then my number one thing is to be able to take away the wings but also to be able to slant the ball. And we were big on that is that we were trying to force the ball to the middle of the floor into the trail defenders help positioning. So if you want to think about that trail defender or one pass away defender, if the ball is coming up the right side, we're forcing it left into the middle of the floor. And then depending on where there's a trail player or a player behind the ball, that player would sit and help and form what we call a slant. You could call it a soft trap. Yeah. But their job is to stop the ball. So right. our idea is that we're trying to force the point guard to push it and not be able to hit ahead, but then we want to contain that. Right. And so when teaching this, we're going to go back to slow learning. Do you do this five on O or do you do this five on five slow learning? Or do you do small sided games like five on three? How do you go about teaching at, at your college, uh, at your previous college level? Well, and I've done it at high school and younger levels, yeah. but uh, the, the, the main thing, again, is I believe it is a five on five slow learning situation where you, you just go through some kind of really slow learning reps, say a team's on offense for five trips, they go there, boom, they come back, they go there, they come back, but there's defense on and the defense is the idea of slow learning for the defense is that they are in the correct positioning. So Mm -hmm. it gives perspective to the offense about this. And then we could go through again, similar to a lot of fast break drills where they go through this progressive, you know, five on oh, five trips and we score a layup and then we score a wing hit. Then we score a trail three. You know, you have this progression kind of you go through. You're going through that in the slow learning concept. Here's the difference. After we go say these five on five reps of slow learning where one team gets five reps and then the other team gets five reps, then we want to go live. We want to toss it off the backboard and say, okay, let's go. And it's going to be messy. It's going to be ugly. It's yep. all those things. Yep. But you know what? When we do five on O and go to five on five, it's messy and ugly anyways. So my point is we want to go to the five on five to give them a perspective. And yep. then if we need to, and I'll be honest, you generally need to go through some five on O or what we like to do is five on two reps of the two side. And all of that's on the website. And we have a whole course that helps you introduce and understand that uh, for those that aren't members yet. Um, but it's, 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 again, it's a process of teaching, but trying to connect them with the decision and the skills at the same time in the context of the game. Okay. So when teaching a new skill, so I just, you just got me thinking whether it is the, uh, the two side or whatever else you're running, how many reps in a row, meaning how many trips in a row would you give them before intervening? And that doesn't mean that you're not coaching the whole time, but how, like how many say I'm saying we're going down and back or something like that. And then we, we debrief and we, we talk about like what we could have done better. How do you put that into your practice? Well, let me, uh, let me connect that slow learning concept, maybe more for coaches. Think of about it as a walkthrough. Yep. Like we yep. do scout walkthroughs and stuff like that. That's what it is. Essentially. It's a walkthrough. Uh, and so in that case, yeah, we're talking a little bit more. It's not a coaching clinic. It's all about the players. So we're just trying to connect them with the ideas and the possibilities you know, if the ball goes here, this is what's possible. If the ball goes there, this is possible. But then after that, yeah, we do want to kind of organically let it kind of shape a little bit through some of the mess. 
so that players let, get used to figuring out solutions on their own. And that involves us, again, allowing it to go a little bit in terms of, say, two trips, you know, and maybe we go two trips at first and let them go. But I would say also early in learning, I am more likely to use my interventions, uh, my classroom management strategies, which is hold, recreate. Recreate means go back to the situation where we want to teach. And then we talk about that situation with a short burst of information, say, hey, listen, did you see this possibility right here? Okay, no. Okay, let's make this pass and now live from there. So we're not going all the way back to the beginning. We're just trying to hold and recreate in the context of what we want to intervene or throw an intervention into and then let them go from there. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Well, Chris, you've been very generous with your time and I really appreciate you coming on. Tell us more about where people can find you and what you've got going on right now. <laughs> what do we not have going on? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm so grateful for people like you, William. I mean, you do such an amazing job supporting the game of basketball. And, uh, you know, obviously you're a member of our community and we're proud of that. And, uh, you know, just being able to connect with people like you on a daily basis has just been the remarkable blessing of my life in coach education. And that's been amazing. So I thank you. And I thank all the other members and all the other people that have interacted with me on social media through at bball immersion on Twitter, basketballimmersion.com, which is the main focus of our website, uh, immersionvideos.com, which, which is where we're monetizing and helping coaches monetize their intellectual property. So we have videos from Nate Oates or Doug Novak or Aaron Fern or different people like that. Uh, and then the basketball podcast, which is the other area, which for me is like blown me away about how I'm able to have these coaching conversations with some really high level coaches from all around the world and have people listen and, uh, you know, interact with the material in so many ways. So uh, definitely on Twitter at B-Ball Immersion. Uh, my DMs are open. You can reach out to me anytime. And uh, we'd love to have all of your listeners join Basketball Immersion and become a member of our community. And, uh, you know, again, 25 courses, 600 plus videos and 70 plus master classes of, you know, different experts from around the world sharing the game. I mean, it's been amazing what type of community it's become with people like yourself. So thank you so much. It, definitely go check out Basketball Immersion. It, I'm on it daily and I don't exaggerate. I'm not exaggerating when I say that, but the amount that you can learn from not just Chris, but the people who are on the podcast, the master classes that they have um, in terms of video, the content that um, you guys post is second to none. Like, for example, I was on a master class yesterday on the train. I was listening to Alex talking about <clears throat> the science of the timeout or something like that. And the feedback that you can give um, players and make the timeout most efficient. Like who talks about that? No one talks about that. Yet it's so important, right? It's so important, um, these things. And we don't even really think about it. A lot of the times we're concerned with the X's and O's. But when looking at how we give feedback, how we do timeouts, slow learn, all this stuff, highly recommend this site. So <clears throat> Chris, again, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, just hold the line. And guys, we will see you next week. Thank you, Will.